Oregon values are my values. Join me and let's stand up for Oregon. Alex Scarlatos is running for Congress in Oregon's 4th District, looking to unseat longtime Representative Peter DeFazio. Scarlatos is undoubtedly best known, though, for his role in stopping an attempted terrorist attack while on a train bound for Paris in 2015. A guy with an AK entered the train cabin, so me and my friend got down, and I said, basically, let's go, told him to go, and he went, <laughs> and he tackled him. The former National Guard soldier and his two friends were honored for their bravery by both the French and United States governments. The three also starred in a Clint Eastwood film about that fateful day. Since then, Scarlatos has been back in Roseburg, where he's lived since high school. I met him at Casey's Restaurant, which has been making headlines of its own recently. And they actually were hit with a $14,000 fine by the state of Oregon for opening 10 days early during the coronavirus, uh, when Douglas County, where we are now, had only, I think, two remaining cases that were both in the hospital. When I heard about the fine that they were hit with, I felt like I needed to talk to them and figure out kind of what they were dealing with with the state and kind of really just talk to them about how they thought the state was being too heavy handed and what they think the state could do better. In general, how do you feel about the state's response to the coronavirus or the nation since you're running for a national position? So I think the state and really the country's kind of gone a little bit over the top when it comes to coronavirus. I understand the need for a shutdown, especially in the major metropolitan areas, but after getting a few weeks into it, um, I just think that we went a little overboard, shutting down everywhere regardless of the number of cases, especially in rural Oregon where there really aren't that many cases. People are more spread out, less likely to spread the disease. I think we should have adjusted a little bit earlier, and I think Casey's had to do that themselves just to survive, and of course they were punished by the state of Oregon. That's the last time we're going to talk about coronavirus. We're going to talk about you now. So everybody knows who you are, or thinks they do. You were on Dancing with the Stars. You're a national hero, international hero. Starred in a Clint Eastwood movie. What don't people know? I hope they know that we're running for Congress. Um, I think that's the biggest thing we're trying to get out now is that I'm running for Congress in 4th Congressional District of Oregon. Um, I don't think people know that I'm a Republican, but that's also what I'm running on. Um, it's just something I've kind of felt like I needed to do after seeing really how this part of Oregon has been treated. I mean, this is the poorest congressional district in Oregon. Uh, we used to be one of the wealthiest. We had the wealthiest school district in the country in the 80s. And of course now, I mean, we're dealing with very high child abuse rates. Uh, very high homeless rates and drug use rates. So that's kind of a pessimistic picture. Why do you want to represent District 4? Well, I want to represent District 4 to turn it around, of course. I mean, I, I'm not very, I'm not a pessimistic person. I, I know we can do a lot better. We have done a lot better in the past. It's just the last 25, 30 years, conveniently about the same time that Peter DeFazio has been in office. We've really taken a very steep decline as a district, and that's what I would look uh, forward to turning around. So obviously, Peter DeFazio has been in office since before you were even born. What specifically, what specific areas has he failed in? Well, I think, yeah, I mean, not to mention, I believe in term limits, and I think 33 years is too long for any politician. But he hasn't really brought home the bacon for his district. I mean, he's been in, in office for 33 years. He's the chairman of the transportation and infrastructure and still has never passed a major piece of legislation, which, I mean, when you look at what this district needs, transportation and infrastructure is one of the top requirements, and he's the chairman and still unable to accomplish anything to me is shocking. Uh, not to mention the timber industry here is kind of what we rely on. There's no real backup plan to the timber industry for southwestern Oregon. And seeing how little income has been brought in from the timber industry, how little tax dollars for county government has been brought in from the timber industry is probably going to be my main priority, get us back out, out into the woods, managing the forest in a way that prevents forest fires, and then brings in money for the counties and schools and things like that. So realistically, what can a congressman do to make that happen? Well, realistically, it pretty much is the sole responsibility of the federal government. Since the ONC laws made a huge chunk of land in Oregon federal, it's the job of the federal government to solve that problem. So I would look at reforming the ONC Act and 
getting us back up at least to our mandatory minimums of 500 million board feet a year um, just to help out the economy, help out county governments that rely on those tax dollars and of course to help out our economy and prevent forest fires. Obviously timber very high on, on your priority list. Yes. What are some of the other high priority items? Timber of course I think is number one uh, as long as or a, along with the economy and just getting the economy turned around overall. I think there's a lot of tertiary industries that would be helped out by the timber industry coming back. Um, but along with that, I'm very big on veterans affairs being a veteran. I think the VA could do a lot better job supporting our veterans and helping them with their quality of care. I mean, we shouldn't send people to war if we can't at least commit to helping them with their medical care with the injuries they sustained overseas when they get back. Uh, also, the Second Amendment, of course, is very important to me. I think seeing these riots going on in major cities across the country just reiterates how important it is. Police are not always going to be there to help you. Uh, I mean, even the example in my own life, of course, of the terrorist attack on the train. I mean, this guy got a fully automatic AK-47 and a handgun in the middle of a gun-free continent. Uh, so I just don't believe gun-free zones work, and I think everyone should have a right to defend themselves and their family. You mentioned the, the riots that we're seeing right now, so uh, what are your views on police reform? Well, I'm not for defunding police at all. I mean, I think that would only make the problem worse. I think the problem really is a lack of training, and by defunding police, you're only going to get worse trained police. I mean, if they don't have the funding for training, that's going to be the end result. Um, so I would, I would probably put the emphasis more on training police than, you know, better equipment even, or the militarization of police. Um, I just think that they need to be instructed with how to deal with people. I mean, not every person is the same. Uh, you can't treat them the same. And I mean, a lot of police have problems dealing with people with mental health issues. Again, talking about the 4th Congressional District here, we have a very high percentage of population that are homeless or have mental problems that police necessarily aren't trained to deal with. And then of course in the cities, I mean, like the George Floyd incident, which of course nobody agrees with, we're just trying to figure out what the best solution is to those kinds of problems. And I think it's more training for police as opposed to less and therefore less funding. What about some of the other reforms we've heard, like uh, Amash's qualified immunity bill? Are you supportive of any of those bills that are being I'm introduced not sure right now? Qualified immunity. <laughs> Sorry. Where you can't sue someone for violating your rights unless it's already been clearly established in another pre precedent that someone had their rights violated in the exact same way. So reforms like that, that would make it easier for people to sue police departments. I'm not sure if that's necessarily the best route to go, and honestly, I'm not that educated on that specific one. Um, police departments get sued all the time, so I'm not sure if making it easier for them to be sued is the right answer either. Um, I mean, you can even sue the police officer specifically by name and the police chief by name, so they get hit with lawsuits all the time, and I don't necessarily think that that's the problem. Um, I mean, I, like I said, I'd have to look more into that issue, honestly. In terms of where you affiliate yourself, are do you, you consider yourself a Republican. Are you going to be the kind of Republican who votes along party lines on everything, or are you open to bipartisanship? I'm absolutely open to bipartisanship. I mean, we kind of need that, especially in this day and age, and especially with uh, ONC reform, which, like I said, is going to be my main priority. This is something where... Republicans and Democrats should agree on, but they don't because of party lines. I mean, harvesting more trees is actually better for the environment when, it, when you count global warming, reducing uh, emissions overall and carbon dumped into the atmosphere due to forest fires and decaying trees that aren't allowed to be harvest logged. I mean, this is a huge area for compromise that Republicans and Democrats should agree on that we don't. I consider myself to be a more libertarian leaning Republican personally. But, I mean, I would definitely be bipartisan. I mean, Peter DeFazio, seeing his voting record and how often he votes along party lines, to me, just shows that you can't really get anything done if you vote along party lines every single time. What about your views on the president? Do you, are you supportive of him in general? Uh, supportive of his demeanor? <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I support the president. I think everything that he's done so far has been overall a net positive for this country 
and I think we're at least moving in the right direction. Obviously, there are some specific things and maybe his demeanor that I think he could do better, um, but I don't think that there's any person in the world that's perfect, but I think President Trump is at least moving the country in the right direction overall. So on the podcast that we were talking about earlier, Free Range America, uh, at one point you said that we have a choice this election between basically freedom and socialism. What did you mean by that? Well, I just mean that if you look at where this country is heading, I mean, it seems like we're getting more and more divided. Democrats are becoming more socialist and Republicans, I guess you could say, are becoming more extreme in whatever way you think Republicans are extreme. Um, and it's just becoming more clear. There's a larger difference between Democrats and Republicans, and I believe Republicans are the party that best re represents freedom and Democrats, I think, are trying to move this country into more socialist points of views, like you see with Bernie Sanders and even Peter DeFazio and AOC and Nancy Pelosi. And I just think that it's just becoming a more and more clear cho choice for Americans, and I hope they side with me. I mean, Peter, like I said, Peter DeFazio has had 33 years to uh, accomplish his agenda and prove why he should be reelected, and I think that our district overall is worse off because of Peter DeFazio, not better, and I think it's time we give someone else a shot. So with him having been there for 33 years, how do you campaign against something like that? He has all of the experience, all of the, the backers and the funding and all of the connections. What's your strategy? Well, I think it's just that. I mean, he's been there for 33 years. He has all of the backing from PACs and special interests. and. He's a very senior member of Congress, and he still hasn't been able to accomplish anything major. And he still hasn't been able to bring home the bacon for his district. I mean, I'm not necessarily just campaigning as an anti-DeFazio. I mean, there's a lot of things we disagree on, but um, I would like to see this congressional district move in a totally opposite direction just about of what Peter DeFazio would like to see. I mean, his latest infrastructure bill is so extreme and he didn't work with Republicans at all that they're not even going to entertain the idea and they're going to go with the Senate's infrastructure bill instead. And when you're that partisan and that divisive, I mean, it's no wonder why you can't get anything accomplished. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like your campaign is very on the ground, kind of organically growing. We're grassroots, but we're not off the cuff or shooting from the hip. <laughs> um, but yeah, we almost all of our donations have come from small dollar donors across the state, across the country. And that was going to be one of my points too. Obviously DeFazio has all of the big donations. He's, you know, out fundraising you by a huge margin. But you're whoa, actually, whoa, 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 whoa. he's got like one million something he, already. He has, he has more money in the bank than we do, but we've actually been out fundraising him since the start of 2020. Particularly with individual contributions, Absolutely. the small like 100, 200, 500. That's the only way we're going to out fundraise him because I mean, as an incumbent, he has the advantage with PACs and even corporations. And so, if we're going to out fundraise Peter DeFazio, we have to do it with small dollar donors across the country. Really, what do you think it says about your campaign that you are really resonating with the you know average Joe on the street who's willing to write you a check for 200 bucks? I mean, just that. I mean, that's how we're raising our money. That's how we're getting our support. Uh, we've had people message our page all the time saying that they're lifelong Democrats. I mean, if you look at this race or the history of this race, I mean, we've had 10 years of Art Robinson versus Peter DeFazio. People on the right and the left are tired of both of those choices, and they probably think both choices are too extreme. We're trying, I mean, I'm obviously running as a conservative and a very fiscal conservative, but we're trying to be the choice for all the people in the middle and we're running on the common sense issues that I think most people would like to see accomplished. I mean, because even if I run on a divisive issue on the right or the left, the odds of it getting accomplished once I'm elected are still very small. So we're running on the things that most people agree with and most people want to see accomplished, like timber, VA, healthcare, and the economy. It's no surprise to you who's lived in Oregon for well over a decade that it's a very blue state. Uh, this particular seat hasn't been held by a Republican for almost 40 years, I want to say. I think it's about 45 years. 45 yeah. years. Realistically, how do you turn a district like this red? Well, like you said, Oregon, of course, is a very blue state, but this district has been trending more and more red as the years go by. It's gone red for presidential candidates, governor's candidates, secretary of state candidates. It's just never gone red, of course, in the congressional race that we're running in. 
and part of that is a lack of good Republican candidates and organization on the Republican side. And of course, that's something that we're hoping to change. But I mean, President Trump only lost this district by about 550 votes in 2016. It was the closest congressional district in the country that he lost. Um, it's the Cook PVI, I think, is zero, which is even. So theoretically, anyway, it should be a tie. I mean, it's, it should be considered a toss-up district, especially when you consider that, again, Peter DeFazio, he votes with AOC 96% of the time, but he's from a toss-up district and she's not. Peter DeFazio does not represent this district anymore, and that's why I think that it's winnable. Is your only other uh, like political background when you ran for Douglas County Commissioner? Correct. I've been interested in politics for a, a while now. I met my state senator on a plane, and he encouraged me to look at politics as a way of continuing to, I guess, fight for what we believe in. And uh, I mean, honestly, the more I learned, the angrier I got, especially with the timber issues and the way the economy in southwestern Oregon has gone downhill since the late 80s. And I mean, it just made me angry enough to want to actually do something about it. So obviously, when I'm interviewing you right now, you're not currently a county commissioner. What happened in that election and what did you learn from it? Uh, in that election, uh, I learned a lot. <laughs> I learned that politics is a very dirty business, so I'm not going into this race naive at all. Uh, I also learned that, I mean, it's tough to run a, an outsider race and that you need to do a lot of certain things very specifically, especially getting grassroots support on your side. Uh, there is no real substitution for grassroots support. I mean, you can have all the money in the world, but if people don't want to elect you, they're not going to elect you. Um, and so, I, I mean, I learned a lot. It was a huge learning experience, and I'm hoping to take all that experience into this election against DeFazio. Assuming it's November, you get elected, how are you going to stay in touch with the community? Are you going to get an apartment in D.C.? <laughs> you pretty much have to get an apartment in D.C. I mean, I'm going to be there probably six months out of the year, but I mean, I still live in Roseburg, and I love it here. I would much rather live in Roseburg full-time than D.C. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would absolutely stay in touch with the district. I mean, I'm, I've lived here over 10 years. Um, this is my home. These are the people I'm fighting for. Uh, this is the reason why I'm going to Congress is not to be a politician. I would, I would be happy with just serving two or three terms. And if I can get what I came to accomplish done, then I would be totally happy to ride off into the sunset and never deal with politics again. Like I said, it's a horrible business. and. Um, I'm only running because I want to actually accomplish something for the people here. And if you don't win, what's next? I don't really have a backup plan, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, we're kind of going all in. Uh, I mean, I think we stand a very good chance of winning in November. Um, so I really don't have a backup plan, and I'm not, I'm not trying to even put my head in that space. <laughs>